At 16.30 hours, a Ukrainian MiG-29 raced along the Dnipro Valley at 150 meters altitude. Its nose pointed toward the Mirovka Dam that Russian forces had converted into a rolling supply corridor. The pilot kept to the lowest folds of terrain, using each ripple of earth like a shield, unaware that three Russian radars were already shaping firing solutions. An S-400's gravestone array was painting him from roughly 38 kilometers, a Tor M2 tracked from the south, and a Buk M3 warmed its emitters in the east. It was overlapping coverage designed to turn any aircraft into drifting metal fragments within seconds. The pilot scanned the live reconnaissance feed projected onto his multifunction display. The dam, once a civilian infrastructure artery, now carried lines of Russian cargo trucks driven by pressed Ukrainian civilians. That meant the strike window was measured in minutes, not hours. If he waited for full darkness, the civilian drivers would still be there. If he acted now, the route remained clear. The MiG skimmed the valley at 880 kilometers per hour, the walls on either side masking him from most long-range search radars. But the natural protection would evaporate once the riverbanks leveled out into farmland. Beyond that point stretched eight kilometers of flat exposure that pilots silently called the gallery, where radar beams had free reign and missiles enjoyed predictable geometry. He listened to the subtle, metronome-like tones of the SPO-15 warning receiver. Each pulse told him who was watching and roughly how far they were. Slow, lazy sweeps meant distant search. Faster, rhythmic pulses meant growing interest. Continuous tone meant launch was likely seconds away. Right now, the S-400's rhythm hovered between mild curiosity and imminent hostility, somewhere between two and three Mississippi counts. It was the kind of threat level where a pilot stayed low, stayed fast, and prayed the terrain had enough folds to break line of sight. The hammer glide bomb slung under his centerline ran its quiet diagnostics. The weapon needed altitude and stability during release, conditions currently incompatible with flying just above treetop level, but the pilot locked that thought away. There would be time to solve the delivery problem if he survived these next few minutes. His fuel gauge showed a bit more than 2,400 kilograms, enough for roughly 18 minutes on station before the return leg became a forced march. Every second an afterburner or every sharp evasive turn would drain that buffer like a cracked tank. At 16.38 hours, the valley walls eased away and radar exposure hit him like opening a door into a furnace. The SPO-15 erupted into a chaotic symphony. What had been sweeping pulses turned into tightly focused beams. The S-400 locked him at 38 kilometers. The tone shifted from warning chirp to solid, unwavering scream. It meant the operator had eyes on him. The computer had solved the intercept, and authorization was all that remained. He rolled knife edge, pulling 7G as he sliced his velocity vector perpendicular to the radar line. Doppler radars relied on detecting relative motion. Zero radial velocity meant the MiG's speed looked identical to the ground's. To the gravestone array, he became moving terrain. The lock snapped, but he bled energy and drifted several degrees off course. In combat aviation, every correction bought survival at the cost of position, and every loss of position meant another threat would fill the vacuum. A Torum II to the south activated almost instantly. The system used command guidance, meaning no onboard seeker to jam. The ground station tracked both missile and target, adjusting course through rapid-fire commands. His only option was to break lock by diving into thicker ground clutter. He dropped from 150 meters to 50 in less than two seconds. Trees blurred beneath him, their tops flicking past the canopy, as if reaching upward to touch the jet's belly. He punched the chaff release. Aluminum-coated fibers cut to precise lengths for X-band, and K-band dispersion blossomed behind the aircraft, forming a temporary corridor of false echoes. The TOR's radar struggled to maintain a consistent return amid the swirling storm of reflections. Then he thumbed the SPS-141 electronic countermeasure pod alive. It generated a ghost return, a deliberately brighter, artificially stable target that lured the radar's tracking gate away from the real MiG. The TOR operator saw what looked like a steady climb, while the true aircraft vanished back into messy ground clutter. Flying at 50 meters was a loan borrowed from fate, due any moment. 
He needed altitude for weapon release, but he could not climb without dragging every radar within 80 kilometers onto his back. Four kilometers remained before his minimum release point. The fuel gauge ticked down past 2,100 kilograms, the number shrinking at a rate he did not like. If he committed to a vertical maneuver, it would need to be perfect. At 1640 hours, he made the choice. He slammed the throttles into afterburner and pulled straight up. The RD-33 engines erupted into twin spears of orange flame, stretching six meters behind the jet. He transformed from a shadow in the folds of the Earth into a sky-bright beacon that no radar could ignore. Dozens of screens across eastern Ukraine lit with a single climbing contact. Fire control crews scrambled for calculation updates. Operators routed fresh trajectory predictions through their consoles. The MiG shot past 1,000 meters, then 2,000, then climbed toward 5,000 in a vertical helix, as he added a rolling twist designed to scramble intercept math. The opposing fire control computers struggled. None were designed for a target performing a rolling corkscrew with variable climb rate. Predictive algorithms sketched intercept points only for those points to shift every half second. Radar beams chased a moving riddle. Three systems achieved lock simultaneously, but none held it long enough for a clean launch. At the peak of his climb, 5,000 meters, the pilot rolled inverted. The strike window had arrived. The hammer's logic board registered stable release parameters. The HUD confirmed green, but his threat receiver was screaming, a solid wall of overlapping tones. Missiles were likely in the air already. He leveled for two seconds, exactly two, and released. The bomb separated cleanly. The moment it did, the MiG shed weight and regained agility. He rolled inverted again and dove, pulling more than 9G. A metallic groan whispered from his left wing root, but the airframe held. He dropped from 5,000 to 500 meters in eight seconds, shockwaves shuddering across the fuselage as he broke the sound barrier. The S-400 missiles overshot, their seekers losing the jet below, minimum depression angle. They self-destructed thousands of meters overhead. Behind him, the hammer, the hammer ignited and climbed on its own arc. The Book M3 targeted it, wasting a multi-million dollar interceptor on a weapon that did not need to survive, only to guide. The bomb rose past 8,000 meters, then tipped nose down, seeker cooling to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Ahead waited the dam that Russian logistics had turned into a lifeline. The hammer's infrared seeker scanned the dam with precision, detecting a thermal gradient between the sun-warmed concrete at 35 degrees Celsius and the cooler water below at 15. That 20-degree differential painted the structure as clearly as if someone had traced it with fluorescent ink. The onboard processor compared the signature against preloaded templates, confirming the linear form and expected temperature pattern. GPS and inertial navigation cross-checked the position. The bomb was certain of its target within 10 meters. Eight kilometers from the impact point, every millisecond counted. The MiG threaded through the terrain at 100 meters, using the last valleys as shields. Behind him, radar pulses began sweeping wider, searching for the disappeared jet. Russian operators had seen only fragments, false echoes, and the occasional ground return. The MiG was invisible to them, a ghost slipping under their attention while its payload climbed higher beyond their reach. The hammer accelerated through 300 meters per second, then 320, then 340. Micro adjustments of its control surfaces altered its trajectory by centimeters, each fine movement translating into meter level corrections on the ground. The combination of GPS data and inertial guidance ensured dual redundancy. Any deviation from the calculated path would automatically correct itself, maintaining the precision required to strike a structure engineered to resist such attacks. At 700 meters, the MiG banked sharply, heading for cover behind a fold of terrain. The pilot had to descend quickly to avoid missile reacquisition. 1,000 meters behind, the first waves of radar light swept the airspace, illuminating nothing but dust, trees, and the echo of a ghost aircraft. The MiG had become a shadow, barely distinguishable from the ground clutter, while the hammer continued its silent climb to impact altitude, immune to the systems hunting the jet itself. The MiG's fuel situation was deteriorating. 
2,100 kilograms now, each maneuver and afterburner pulse, eroding the margin for a safe return. He calculated trajectories, banking angles, and throttle settings with the same instinct that had been honed through countless flight hours. Survival and mission success depended on precision timing. The result was immediate. Convoys halted, fuel and logistics were delayed by over 47 kilometers, and operational tempo was disrupted in ways planners had not anticipated. Russian forces scrambled to reroute supplies, attempting to navigate new, unplanned obstacles. The MiG, still low, turned for home, threading back through valleys and masking himself against radar sweeps. The aircraft remained undetected, moving from shadow to shadow, each maneuver calculated to buy seconds of safety and preserve fuel. At 16.45 hours, radar teams finally registered a dingle radar echo of the MiG over farmland. Too late to react. By the time interception systems calculated speed and trajectory, the aircraft had already passed the engagement window and the pilot had extended the margin between threat and survival. The hammer's impact had already rewritten supply calculations. Russian air defense had fired multiple missiles at empty sky, wasting multi-million dollar interceptors against what was no longer a target. The MiG's return flight relied on every ounce of remaining fuel, 2,000 kilograms now. Each maneuver eaten by terrain following adjustments. Exhaust heat, afterburner consumption, and aerodynamic drag all worked against the aircraft. He passed ridges, crossed rivers, and traced the valleys back to friendly lines, every second measured. The precision of the strike had been absolute, the mission risk high, and the cost of failure catastrophic. The dam now breached. The hammer's thermal and kinetic energy ensured that the infrastructure collapse could not be immediately repaired. Supply chains disrupted, trucks stranded, and logistical planning forced into improvisation. The pilot, having executed extreme evasive maneuvers, approached his base at reduced speed, radar coverage still uncertain. Every creak of the airframe, every pulse of the engine, reminded him that one mistake could be fatal. The pilot crossed the final ridges at 100 meters, each fold of terrain masking him from intermittent radar sweeps. Behind him, the chaos he had sown continued to ripple through Russian command centers. Missiles that had been launched against his ghost returns detonated harmlessly in farmland, chaff clouds and electronic countermeasures having successfully manipulated targeting algorithms. Every calculation on the opposing consoles had been based on deception, giving the MiG precious minutes to escape without engagement. Descending to lower valleys, he monitored fuel levels. 2,000 kilograms were now approaching 1,800, a thin margin for the remaining 50 kilometers to base. Every meter of altitude gained or lost, every maneuver to dodge radar or avoid terrain collisions, consumed fractions of a percent measured in kilograms of jet fuel. Precision had been critical in execution. Conservation was equally essential in extraction. Above, the hammer's destruction left debris in the water, concrete chunks spanning tens of meters, still suspended in shock-propelled arcs. Thermal imaging from command centers displayed a stark white scar against the cooling river. Calculations made in seconds predicted supply delays of at least 47 kilometers for Russian convoys. Logistics impossible to reroute efficiently without significant delays. Civilian vehicles trapped on the dam's roadway remained unharmed, a testament to the precision targeting enabled by thermal differential and GPS coordination. The MiG crested the last hill and leveled at 70 meters, now nearly invisible to any radar system still sweeping the area. He rolled gently, using a natural depression to avoid any line-of-sight acquisition. The terrain provided the final layer of defense, and every pulse of radar behind him continued to chase what no longer existed. The aircraft moved as if part of the Earth itself, blending with shadows, riverbanks, and tree lines a controlled ghost through hostile territory. As he neared friendly airspace, mission metrics flashed through the cockpit. Speed maintained at 880 kilometers per hour, fuel sufficient for a return leg, all sensors reporting nominal. The hammer's detonation profile and trajectory had executed flawlessly. Thermal imagery confirmed full compliance with preloaded targeting templates. The dam's concrete fractured cleanly, the 60-meter breach stabilized as predicted, and the river's flow now prevented further passage along the former supply corridor. Russian air defense operators were still reacting. 
Book M3 systems recalculated tracking envelopes. Tor M2 continued attempts to maintain command guidance, and the S400 gravestone radar reinitiated sweeping patterns. Every launch window that had existed before the strike now proved meaningless. Targets were gone, missiles had detonated against terrain or phantom returns, and tracking algorithms were feeding false data. Every calculation, every evasive maneuver, and every decoy had executed exactly as planned. The MiG had survived threats from three overlapping radar systems, multiple surface-to-air missile solutions, and extreme aerodynamic stress, returning to base intact. The battlefield impact was immediate and strategic. Russian command structures had to account for both the sudden removal of the dam as a supply conduit and the proven capability of Ukrainian strike aviation to operate in high-threat environments. Convoy reroutes, recalculation of logistical windows, and threat assessments all required immediate attention. The MiG's flight had achieved not only a tactical effect, but also a psychological one, demonstrating the lethality and precision of high-risk strikes in contested airspace. As the aircraft shut down, telemetry indicated final fuel, remaining at just over 1,500 kilograms, a narrow margin of survival carefully preserved by disciplined throttle management. The pilot, breathing heavily, monitored systems for residual heat, vibrations, and hydraulic pressures. Every element of the aircraft was checked, ensuring readiness for subsequent missions. The precision, planning, and execution of this strike would serve as a case study in controlled risk and operational efficiency. In the following hours, imagery from reconnaissance drones confirmed structural collapse and the complete interdiction of the Marivka Dam Supply Route. Civilian infrastructure remained largely intact beyond the immediate breach, demonstrating the effectiveness of targeted, high-precision ordnance. Russian logistical units faced immediate recalibration, the impact of which would be felt for weeks as alternate routes were prepared under fire. The mission's combination of low-altitude flight, advanced countermeasures, electronic deception, and precision munitions exemplified modern combat aviation tactics, terrain exploitation, Thermal signature analysis, GPS-assisted guidance, and careful energy management converged to allow a single aircraft to execute a strike that disrupted supply lines, inflicted material damage, and avoided civilian harm. The Ukrainian MiG-29's return to base marked the end of a mission that had combined split-second decision-making, technical mastery, and disciplined execution. From approach through egress, every element had been optimized to reduce exposure, maximize weapon effectiveness, and create uncertainty for enemy operators. In the aftermath, Russian forces were left to reconcile both the tactical loss of infrastructure and the proof that highly skilled aviation crews could penetrate even heavily monitored airspace.